Hey everyone, Hoff here. Before we get started, we just want to send out a big thank you to our partner, Grind Coffee Co., for their support of the show. They're a convenient subscription service offering specialty grade, single source, 100% Arabica coffee, available in whole bean and drip grind. Check out grindcoffeeco.com. Thanks again to Grind Coffee Co. for supporting the show. Hey everybody, this is Jimmy DeResta, and you're listening to The Builder Sessions. Welcome to The Builder Sessions, a podcast where we chat with your favorite builders. We get to know them, their stories, and hopefully inspire you to have to coach and build something cool. I'm Hoff. And I'm Rosie. And on this episode, we chat with Jimmy DeResta. We chat about his background in art school, 3D design, and teaching, his creative process, which informs his storytelling, and how if you're not curious, you're dead inside. All this and more in this episode of The Builder Sessions. Jimmy, welcome to the Builder Sessions. Hey guys, how are you? Um, thank you, thank you for having me. This is so exciting. I don't know. We're doing better now. We're doing better. <laughs> we, we were talking before we hit record. Um, you were one, you were like on our list when when Hoff and I started the show. You were you were like the I think I don't know if we still have that in one of the drives or whatever, but you were the number one that we wanted to get <laughs> on because we we well, thank you. The show is all about like makers and people in the trades and just learning their stories and mm -hmm. just you're just someone we both followed and really look up to continue to look up to and this is thank awesome. you so this is a long time coming and we really appreciate you coming on the show thank you very much thank you thank you but for those of our listeners though who are unfamiliar who jimmy yep. Resta is tell us a little about right. yourself uh, i've been a maker my whole life i started out working in my dad's shop um, my dad had a shop in the house I grew up in. He was a New York City fireman and a handyman. And my dad's, uh, he passed away in November, but he died at uh, 83 that. years old. So he uh, he lived a good life. And uh, growing up, he was never afraid to put tools in the hands of myself and my siblings. So he let us play with everything. So when you guys watch me on YouTube, you see how dangerous I am. It's really my dad's fault because he never <laughs> feared anything. And he never put the, he never instilled fear in us to use tools. So I've been using tools my whole life. I grew up, I went to art college. I went to architecture in high school. For three years, I studied architecture and building and being an architect designer. But we did study framing and electrical and construction and, and forces and all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I went to art school. So I got a good mix of technical and freeform art. I went to art school. I graduated art college in 1990 with a degree in three-dimensional illustration and design basically a BFA. And I went on to teach there for the next 24 years, teaching three-dimensional design illustration. Wow. My curriculum consisted of book binding, 3D modeling, uh, and by hand. Everybody always thinks I'm talking about computer stuff. Mm -hmm. All modeling clay, sculpting wood, the construction as far as boxes, cardboard construction as far as package design goes, graphic design, letter forms, bandsaw, uh, mold making everything a little bit of everything for the 3d modeler and this is all before making was a word or the word of the term of maker or maker spaces i started teaching in 93 i finished in 2017 so however many years that is and in around 20 years ago my brother invited me to help him on a television show my brother's a comedian and an actor and that's how i got into television playing with my brother on camera goofing off and picking garbage and making stuff out of it and I did several TV shows, which led to my YouTube channel. I started in 2010, 2011, and I've been on YouTube all this time, still on YouTube. And since I went on YouTube, I've gotten into a couple of other stupid show ideas that are <laughs> published here and there, including Making Fun, which is on Netflix right now. Love it. That's basically it. And I make YouTube videos for a living now. That's basically it. Hey, <laughs> that's all. That's it. So it sounds like making, I mean, that's just the term, the, that's the, the popular term right now, but that tinkering or whatever it is, that's, it's in your blood. It sounds like. 
It, it really is. It's all I've ever done. Uh, I famously tell the story about how my father encouraged me and my siblings, my two brothers, and I have a sister, but she was too young at the time. My father would ask me and my two brothers to collect names at school for 25 cents a letter. We'd bring home the 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 list to do list and my dad would hand write out the people's names that we that ordered their nameplate and we would cut them out on the jigsaw this is all in elementary and middle school mm. and so we started out early making things and and I, I can honestly say i've never done anything but make things with my hands for a living never had a paper out never worked at a restaurant i worked at a florist but all i did was make all the party favors and construct all the wedding trestles and stuff that's what i did when i worked at the florist Hmm. Wow. So what? How old would you have been operating like a jigsaw or chop saw, bandsaw? Like are we? I started. Like uh, I, yeah, yeah. I started at about eight, nine, seven, eight years old. I started the very first thing I actually started on was a radial arm saw. I was using a ten inch radial arm saw when I was eight, nine years old. Wow. My dad wouldn't let us use it when he wasn't around, and he, yeah. he gave us strict instructions on how to do it and how to like stand with your shoulder straight so you don't the, the wood doesn't the blade doesn't ride on the wood it was i never would let anybody i know near a radio <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> my dad was letting us use it at eight nine ten years old but he always insisted we weren't allowed to use it when he wasn't around which of course we did yeah <laughs> of course how's, how's the you? safety play in that at such a young age because i remember my dad probably put me on a few things maybe a tad bit too young and maybe with not a full explanation or a thorough understanding was there did your dad kind of explain like you're obviously mentioning with the radial arm saw with other equipment was there a good foundation and like explanation yeah, how do you he, think? eye protection was never a thing because i think he's just from that generation where you see catalogs and people using bridge ports and and milling machines and nobody's got glasses on my dad's from that generation <laughs> he always made sure with the radial arm saw, if the if it walked, that's what he'd always say. If the blade walks, just stay out of the zone. So wherever the blade's going to walk to, which means if it rides up across the wood and comes at you, don't just make sure you stay out of that zone and and it, don't ever put your hands and fingers in the blade. <laughs> that's basically all he said. <laughs> he did teach us about kickback and uh, kickback with a circ saw. We never grew up with a table saw until we started, I was a little bit older. So I guess I might've been a young teenager when we started using table saws, job site table saws. I never had a table saw in the shop until I bought my own uh, in art school. So I had a work maker space right after art school. I moved to New York city and I bought a table saw out of the, out of the newspaper used. I bought some guy's old shop. The guy must have been retired or something, or maybe he passed on. I don't know. But we bought every the contents of a full shop. And I still have all those tools I bought. And it included a table saw, a unisaw. And that was a that was a big purchase for me because I had seen a lot of them, people using them in cabinet shops. But I guess I was around 21, 22 years old when I got my cabinet saw. But I had only used job site saws previous to that. But to have like a proper stationary heavy cast iron table saw was a was a big relief no kidding huh. did you have like when you were so growing up obviously you had all this exposure to these different tools did you develop just naturally like the best oh, it, for you like your dream mm -hmm. list of tools that you want to like okay when i get older when i get out of school i'm gonna buy this 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 and this or was it like mm -hmm. whatever i could get my it, hands on for cheap it's really whatever? just a slow progression and i learned early on how to get the best out of what you have so if you have a jigsaw and you need to use if you have a, a handheld jigsaw put it in a an vice upside down and use it as a jigsaw move the material through that uh, you know, we've actually used circ saws clamped upside down as small little table saws. I I even had even when I was very young, I had a, I had a Dremel table saw. This is really going back old school. I, people famously know I hate the, the brand Dremel. I always make fun of it because it could be such a good brand, but they just make the most horrible quality tools. But when I was a kid, they had a certain there was a window when they did make good quality tools, and I had a table saw a mini table saw. It had a four inch blade on it. And I used the hell out of that. So I was really good at working with what I had. And uh, as tools, as my, as my learning progressed and I started getting my hands on other, again, my dad would always get used tools and we'd use the hell out of them. And then my friend worked at a, 
a plumbing supply shop that sold tools and he sold me tools out the back door all the time for pennies on the dollar because he was stealing them and selling them to me. So I still have some of those tools he <laughs> bought me. And I remember, and I still do. It's like, I think to myself, what am I fixated on right at the moment? And that's been my life. I remember fixating on getting a good handheld jigsaw and I bought this this black and not black and decker, a porter cable. A really, really, it's I, it's 30 years old. I bought it brand new. I still have it. I remember like fixating on that and buying that and like loving that. And then, you know, you fixate on the next band. So you're going to get, you fixate on a, a shaper, then you fixate on, and you look on Facebook market or Craigslist and you find it. And I've been doing that my whole life. Just fixate on the next thing I think I need, whether it's a small tool or a big one. And you also rebuild, you've gotten into rebuilding some mm -hmm. saws. Do you enjoy that process of taking something that's really old, probably built? Maybe yeah. I would say better than today's new equipment. A lot, a lot of that equipment is much better than the old. Like I like, I say, I, I hate when equipment stalls. I can't stand when when you're drilling something and it stalls or the belt slips or. So that's why I really love three phase equipment because you can't stall it. It's mm -hmm. very, very, very high torque and runs efficiently as far as electrical is concerned. But when it comes to uh, old tools, I like restoring them to functionality. I, I'm not the type of guy that restores them to perfection, like the paint and all that. Like as long as it runs and drives good and maybe we have to change a bearing, but I'm not cleaning the paint off and painting it again. Yeah. That's, I, I hate that. Yeah. <laughs> I, because I'm going to do it and it's just going to get messed up anyway. It sounds like it's if you were an automotive channel, you'd be one of those guys in the field and getting it to run and just putts around the yard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like, like <laughs> we just talked about Derek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's funny to see Derek finish something, but yeah, when he just gets a car going, it's like that's that's the challenge. It's just getting it going again. And there's something cool about that because it is mm -hmm. the character, you well, like the patina, all the things that like you you see the old matchbook in the on the floor and just like the the stories yeah. that could come out of that dash. You know, it, there's something mm -hmm. cool about that for sure. It's funny. I think it's my Bridgeport. I'm pretty sure it's my Bridgeport. You open the door on the side of the Bridgeport, and there's an old pack of cigarettes in there from the guy who had it years before me. That's awesome. It's like a full pack of cigarettes from like the 1970s or the 80s. It's inside the door, and I just said, "I'll, in spirit of whoever's that is, I'll just leave that there." And it just it just adds to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Why would you throw that away? <laughs> yeah. So it sounds at the like at the forefront with you growing up with all these tools and maybe utilizing them in different aspects problem solving was probably like, it sounded like you have to kind of think on the fly, try and recreate a tool to use it in two or three different ways. You're obviously yeah. doing a lot of that now with your different mediums. Can you kind of speak to how that's your problem solving skills have evolved? Yeah, a lot. As you're going to laugh, a lot of my problem solving skills would derive because I might've broken a tool while my dad was at work and I had to fix it or make it look like I didn't break it or restore the area back to normal or wipe up all the blood from me slicing my thumbprint off or something like that. I, there were the most important way to learn how to problem solve is tinker. I remember when I was a kid, I put a pair of pliers, a pair of lineman pliers, a heavy electrical pliers, and I wanted to cut a bolt. And I've seen my dad just like take a and snap a nail with the, with the line cutters at the bottom. So I had a bolt and I put the bolt in there and I couldn't squeeze it with my hand. My, was too, my hand was too small. So I was like, well, I know what to do. I opened up this vice really wide and I put the pliers in the vice and I squeezed the vice and doop, the handle snapped off of the, the lineman pliers. <laughs> and I was like, there is no way I'm going to be able to fix this. I don't know what to do. So I should have thrown them away, but I hid them under a table <laughs> and years later, my dad was cleaning the shop and he found them and he didn't say anything to me. He didn't like hold them up like, how did this happen? He never said anything. I, remember, I saw them laying on the floor as he was cleaning up and I and like, I just pretended like I, like I didn't look at the dead body. I didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> but the reason I know that's kind of a, a, a an off the topic answer, but the reason I bring it up is because doing stupid things like that, you learn so much about the torque of a vice, how a pair of pliers works, the strength of a bolt where you think you could just snap it and cut it. You know, it, it's it's funny. It's almost like like now when I hang out, I have a girlfriend that's a non-maker and she asked me the most, she's like, can't we just this? I'm like, no, this isn't a magic wand. This is a hammer. You know, she's like, well, I see on people when people do this or that. So it's funny, but as a kid learning up having to use tools, you got to break things, you got to bend things, you got to, 
you got to figure out. I remember once I was using a car jack and I was jack. I was just experimenting with this antique car jack. And it, like I jacked something up and then it fell over and broke something else. And I said, oh, okay, I got to be careful now when I jack something up. So uh, you learn by, you, you learn by failure a lot and you, you learn what not to do. And then you learn what you can do, even if it's a failure. And sometimes you need that failure to solve another problem. Mm-hmm. You know, then when you're in, if you're in MacGyver mode and you're trying to get out of a room before the bomb goes up, you know, you could jack something up and knock something over and then knock the bomb out the window. You know, you start like knowing what little, like, like a house of cards around you. Yeah. Yeah. With, I don't know, that's a stupid answer. But. No, that's a great answer. With with that, keeping that in mind and uh, so that problem solving and um, doing the best with what you have, do you think that contributed to, let's say, your experiences on like making fun where there's like these kids giving you these random ideas and you're yeah. like looking around and you're like, oh, okay, well, maybe that could be the conveyor belt or this can be, you know, how yeah. does that contribute? I could tell you something funny. I really trust my instincts from practicing and tinkering for so, so long, still constantly practicing and tinkering and just saying like, well, I don't know where this is going to go, but let me try it. I, like for instance, I just did this like fake neon sign, which was very much into that spirit of that idea. When it came down to the show, uh, there's when, when you get on TV, they, they negotiate the hell out of you. You know, the, the least important person on, on any TV show is the talent, is the person on camera. But unless you're a very, very famous actor, you get treated like you get paid the least, you get treated the worst. So when the negotiation for the television show came up and about, uh, and it was a very tough negotiation for everyone to get what they wanted. And oh, we're also so busy. And the TV people were like, are you doing your homework? Do you know what we're going to build? And I'm like, yeah, don't worry about it. I'm like, we'll be fine. They're like, <laughs> well, what do you plan on doing? I'm like, I'm not sure yet. When we start, when the cameras roll, I'll do it. And so, well, how do you, how can you be so sure? Because they didn't know me very well. Yeah, they didn't yeah, know yeah. any of us. You know, they just didn't know, like, are we investing in five guys that are just going to. Just wing it? Yeah. Just what we did wing it. Yeah. And I won it. And I was the lead and I won it. And they were all like, Derek was just like, don't try and tell him what to do. He's not going to do it. <laughs> and it was just like, Mike, the producer's like, do you have an idea what we're going to do when we start rolling camera tomorrow? I'm like, yeah, I know. I, I said, we'll figure it out once we get started. And he would just, he would ask for answers. And I just be like, I don't know. When the cameras start, I'll start thinking. And I was like, you don't pay me enough to do my homework. I said, you, yeah. you guys, you pay me for talent on camera. When the camera starts, that's when I'll start working. I said, I have a vague idea what I'm going to do. But if you paid me to be a beforehand designer, I would be doing that right now. Yeah. I said, but you pay me to be on camera talent. That's all I'm going to be is on camera talent. When the camera rolls, I'll give you exactly whatever it is we need. I said, if it doesn't work, we'll do it again. I don't care until we get what you want. But I bring that up to say that I really did rely on my skills and my instincts. And because it was kid stuff, having silly outcomes, the stakes were not very high. Yeah. If if it was live TV, if it was a judging thing where it had to be done in a very specific way. And there was, you know, a big prize at the end. I would have probably done more homework, but I think it lent itself to the fun, loose nature of the show mm-hmm. that, and it, another example of that is they didn't know us at all very well. The producers, the people. So they didn't do their homework, obviously. Well, they saw us on, <laughs> they saw us online, obviously they saw yeah. us online. And it's funny, like uh, they every every camera trick they kind of stole from Jackman. Jackman's like, you guys got to give me time off to make some more videos so that we could steal some more of my ideas from for the show. <laughs> and uh, but um, the uh, I lost my thought. But the oh the one of the first episode, the very first episode, they wrote us a long script for all five of us to study and read, and they said the couple of days before they're like, did you read the script yet? I said no. And they said, you're not going to read the script? It's like, no. I said, I'm not going to read the script. <laughs> <laughs> and me and Derek and everybody, like, we, we 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 weren't protesting. We were just like, it's going to be fine. Don't worry. When the cameras roll, we're going to have fun. Yeah. You you chose it's, us because you saw something in us. Let us yeah. do our thing. Yeah. The script was really just a, a safety net for the writers in case we were all just stiffed up on camera. Yeah. Yeah, At least yeah, if yeah. we read the dumb script that they would have gotten something. It was like a yeah. loose story. But whatever happened, that they soon began to trust everybody's instincts. Everybody trusted each other's instincts to just go out there and have fun and make whatever it was. 
I'd, I'd give Mike, the producer, a few ideas when before we get started on an episode. I'm like, we could do these three things. I'd do a pencil sketch right there in the moment. And, you know, it, 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 as a maker, you can't, you can't turn it off. Mm-hmm. You could pretend to turn it off, and that's what I did. But when I knew we were going to do an episode that involved a dinosaur that vomited tacos, of course, I started thinking of yeah. ways to do it. I just didn't yeah. say it out loud until the camera started rolling. But I had, you know, I did some pre-thought. You can't, you can't help it. Somebody says, hey, make me a lamp out of, uh, you know, spaghetti. Right? As soon as I said that, you guys both have visions of what that is. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can't, you can't turn it off. You know, we have three visions of what a lamp made out of spaghetti is right now. Three versions of that. And when you wake up tomorrow, you'll all have six more each. Yeah. You know, even, even if nobody ever questions you on it, your mind starts to wander. And when we were talking about all these ideas on the show, that's what happened. My mind would wander on all of us, all of ours. But and when we started working, I just let my instincts take over. And that is years and years of tinkering, knowing what to expect, developing a vocabulary for tools and materials. And that all comes from just continuously tinkering and experimenting. I always used to say, when you see a dumpster, jump in the dumpster and rip things apart so you see how they're put together. You could have an opportunity, like when can you have an opportunity to rip a zipper out of a backpack to see how it's sewn in there? You know, when are you going to have an opportunity to break a leg off a table to see if it's joined with biscuits or if it's joined with metal pins or whatever it might be? So type that, all that type of stuff, you know, you're in there, you're picking the garbage, but you're picking technical stuff. You're not picking actual garbage. Yeah. Almost like the deconstruction. I mean, sometimes when we do renos or, you know, whether it's taking a car apart, lots of times it's just hack it up, throw it away. But if you can maybe be particular in that, and like you yeah. said, learn how, you know, this 1960 piece of furniture, the, the yeah. tabletops glued together or whatnot, I think it just makes you versatile. And I think that ties in with your uh, philosophy. I know you've got your kind of, it's your, your slogan and you've got a couple posters I've actually been looking at getting for my shop class. Uh, but that is the um, learn all you can about anything and everything. So it becomes a part of your problem solving arsenal. Right? Yeah, yeah. Users who maybe wanted you to have something pre-done, well, you have all this experience that you can now, you know, use in your problem solving. And I think it's probably yeah. a, listening to your story about that. They wanted something preset where, you know, the five of you are able to come together. And like you said, that spaghetti lab. Now there's five people we can do, you know, some yeah. people are comfortable with that. But when you've got the experience like you do in the group collectively, I think that's where the big growth can happen. Yeah, like one of my favorite scenes of the whole episodes, of all the episodes, was when me and Jackman were, were brainstorming about how this, the, the fist was going to come out of the front of the sneaker. And I made a little model and he made a little model. And the model I made, I, I actually made it in real time. Like the, I remember I was playing with it and Mike like, like snapped at the cameraman. He's like, get over here, get over here. He's not going to stop. And he, the cameraman came and like, I might've paused knowing Mike wanted to film it. And then me and Jackman, I, I can't remember it specifically. It's been a couple of years since I watched it, but I remember in the moment of us having a lot of laughs. And when I saw the edit of that, it was very, it was really fun, but that was the spirit of the show is just brainstorming and coming up with different ways of solving all these stupid things that had like high, no, no high stakes. Yeah. So the, the ability to brainstorm was, wasn't a high pressure situation. And and we had very relaxed, fun, simple ideas. I thought. Now you mentioned you taught at an art school yeah, yeah. for 23 years, that mm-hmm. 3d modeling. And how, how does that progress now? I mean, obviously we're into the digital world. So a lot of it, like you were, we were talking before a lot of it, might be oh is it on AutoCAD or but you were in the physical space dealing with all those mediums. Yeah. Uh, were you just comfortable being able to rely on your skill sets that you've had since you've been, you know, a young child to be able to work with, like you said, wood, metal, all that stuff? Like, can you talk about that? Yeah. Well, the classes were at first they were 30 sessions. So it was the spring and fall semester. So it was 30 different class sessions. So I had a teach them progressively 30 things. That was that was 30 episodes to teach them. And it would start out simple. I can't remember specifically, but I think I started out with showing them what Sculpey Clay was, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, show them Sculpey Clay, how to use Sculpey Clay, how you could bake it in the oven, make it hard. And then I say, okay, let's make a, a thing. And then I bring in mold making material. I'm like, okay, we made this thing. Now we're going to make mold making stuff of it. And then boom, we made a mold. And then we used epoxies and resins to make a generation so now you made something out of clay now you made a mold now you made a generation of it now let's make a package let's assume it's a product 
How are you going to package this? Then let's make a cardboard package that it goes in. All right, we need graphic design. Okay, let's come up with a little bit of a logo. You know what? Let's mar merchandise our logo. Let's make the logo 3D. Let's figure out a way to, to spray paint the logo on the sidewalk. Let's figure out a way to make the logo. So one thing led to another thing led to another thing. And and, and that's that was the spirit of the class is each week was a new discipline. Some weren't always connected. For instance, I'd come in with bits and pieces of brass and soldering and torches and say, okay, let's make a pair of glasses. And so I'd make like these like turn of the century kind of Jules Verne glasses, just goofing off with brass wire and how you could solder it. And then we do an up, we do, I keep saying episodes because my mind is on TV, but we do a class on book binding and how do you bind a book from scratch? And I give them a couple techniques on how to bind a book. And then another week I'd say, okay, uh, let's, let's deal with three-dimensional letters. Take your name, whatever your name is, and what do you think your name would look like? Pick a font. And I always say, you can't make up a font because people aren't good at making up fonts for the most part. So I say, you have to pick a font like you got the Rip Curl shirt on. You know, you got to pick a font and then use that font that describes you. And then you can decorate it, make it out of clay. Is the font going to be... Is the font going to be fire burning in the grass? But it has to be adhered to a particular font. But you, whatever you want to do to that, and that goes back to the old days. Remember the MTV logo? Maybe you guys mm. don't really remember yeah. it. Oh, yeah. But the MTV logo was always doing something. You know, it yeah. was always animated, or it was like a beating heart, or it was a claymation. So I, that was my inspiration for that project. Well, let's do something with your logo. The, just with the progression your name. of skills throughout one like one project now you're like you're yeah. saying going through from creating to which that's really cool because then you're taking the start all the way through in different mediums and in different disciplines even too right yeah and so then my, the first seven to maybe first 10 years of me teaching it was 30 classes so we'd have the the spring the, the fall session and the spring session there would be 30 classes and then they, they kind of folded it back on itself and said, everybody only gets to do one semester. So I had to kind of make it a little bit more 15 classes and then the same 15 classes I would teach in the fall. So that gave me twice as many students. So instead of a student being with me for two semesters, I only ever had like a new, I had a new class every semester, mm -hmm. a whole new batch of students. And so that kind of, I ended up pushing a lot more students through my discipline but it was fun. No, no, no doubt it was fun. So it was, it was the learning was a little bit for me. It was a little bit quicker. I had to like abandon thirty class, uh, fifteen class sessions, and either combine them into other stuff. And then I wouldn't always keep it exactly the same. Some students would take my class two times anyway, just even though it was the same. There was always been some nuances. Yeah. So is the way that you design that reflective of your own personal um, creative process, or yeah. what? What? What would your like a day in the life or someone calls you to make something, to do a project, mm -hmm. whatever it is, let's say even the sign or whatever it is. And what, what, what's your beginning to end? What's your creative process like? Um, well, I, I make these lists. There's some kicking around here. I, I make these lists of things that I want to do and I start whatever bubbles up. For instance, my business partner said, let's make these neon signs experiment with how to make a neon sign. So I started, he sent me some supplies from a supplier that he got the unsigned, fake neon signed stuff, LED strips and stuff. And I started playing with it in the beginning of last week, exactly a week ago today. And um, by Thursday, I was like, I think I might have a good video here. Maybe I'll make a video out of this. And so then Thursday and Friday, I started recording a little bit more in depth and talking to the camera and I got a good video out of it. Even though it was, I never planned on making a YouTube video. I put a lot of stuff on my Patreon, so I'm putting a lot of stuff on my Patreon. But this week I have to travel, so I'm not going to make a video. But I do have right here. I'm going in the spirit of making fun. I'm going to a private school in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, on Thursday and Friday, and I'm going to spend Friday with the kids That's awesome. making their ideas. And these are their ideas. We did a Zoom call, so the kids came up with this. They they wanted to make a. Uh, a robot. What does the robot do? I forget exactly what the robot's supposed to do. I can't remember what the robot does. I have to ask the teachers. <laughs> and then there's somebody wanted a, a a a French toast cannon. Love it. And then a a, a speeding turtle, <laughs> turtle car. 
So I'm going to go down there with the kids and make these. Love it. But in preparation for that, tomorrow I'm going to make them on camera. So I'm going to do a fast forward camera of me making each one of these out of cardboard, tape, hot glue, sticks. Not again, not high stakes. It's really more about just unlocking the creative juices in me and the kids and just having some fun. The kids came up with these ideas. We did a little Zoom call with each one of them. And and so now when I show up, I'm going to make the idea that they thought of and that we did in the Zoom calls. That's amazing. And then because of time and space, they're just going to be little desktop versions of them. Yeah, of course. So is that is that a an area of, That's of uh, interest and passion of yours as far What's as that? like inspiring younger generations to start tinkering? Because yeah, like, that's not how kids don't tinker anymore, right? No, I know. It's funny. When the show came out, and it's such a shame that we're not doing more of the episodes, we only did those eight. But when the show came out, I started getting messages from from other makers that have kids. Like, do you both have kids? I know one of yeah. you does. Yeah. And and I got a lot of maker people were like, my kid never gave a hoot about what I was doing in the shop. And now they see a show and they want to play with the hot glue gun. They want to come out and jigsaw something. They want to. So that was amazing to hear. I mean, we all got those messages, me and Paul and Derek and Pat and John. It was amazing to see like now that you guys are doing it. I'm, I'm annoyed that they didn't care before, but I'm happy they care now. Yeah. Yeah, they think I'm cool now. No, it's kidding. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They yeah. think it's cool to make stuff. Yeah, it's put in the fun realm with that. Like with my kids, they the first episode, it was to be honest, it was kind of like well, I don't know. But then they see the kids' ideas and the like you said, the creator, your creative process collectively bringing something to life, and you can just see the light bulbs going off. And that's just you know two kids out of how many millions that are watching it. Yeah. So I'm sure there's going to be you probably inspired a new generation to. I be, think so. Uh, you know, with the, especially dealing with the different mediums, the metal, the wood, mm. uh, the spray foam, you know, the with the boat, fiberglass, like there's so many mediums that people can create with. That was a nice yeah. way to bring it kind of all together and almost like your courses, right? You're doing multi mediums and different disciplinaries. And it's not just, I think sometimes people can get focused, hyper-focused on one thing. And then if they burn out or don't enjoy it, well, I don't, you know, I'm not into that anymore. Where now they've got, you know, a whole bunch of different ideas and stuff going in their head. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when I was a kid, I remember there was a thing called H&R Puff and Stuff. And they, they it was a production company and they made several TV shows. This is in the late 60s, early 70s. And they, they all their shows involved giant puppets and people in puppet suits. And this story, they had all these stories at Good and Evil. And it was almost like a live action cartoon. And they had several different shows. And I remember seeing a behind the scenes of H and R Puff and stuff of uh, one of the shows, and there's people in these big giant puppet costumes, and showed how the costumes are made. And so that type of stuff for me, when I was at the same age as the kids that are watching us now, that inspired me. There was there was that and stuff like that. And me and Graz were talking one day. And we're like, this it's going to be incredible. Like we like we were kind of daydreaming that the show was going to be a huge hit that it's going to be great. We're going to be inspired generations of young kids. And it's funny. I used to always walk into like, I, I would still do. I walk into a Home Depot and I see an, a guy that recognizes me. And he's like, oh my God, I can't believe you're in this Home Depot. Now, anytime I see a kid in like a supermarket or a non-maker related place, the kid always, I remember I was in a Walmart and the kid was following me and I looked down and I go, you know me? He goes, yeah, I know you. <laughs> and I go, you make stuff? He goes, sometimes <laughs> and i gave him a fist bump and then he ran away screaming mom mom the guy from making fun is here <laughs> <laughs> just need his life <laughs> yeah oh yeah it was so funny the kid was kind of like side-eyeing me and i go you know me he goes yeah i know you <laughs> i go you watch my show he goes yeah that's awesome. <laughs> it was so funny. Like I kind of, when I see kids and they kind of recognize me, I give them the attitude I had on the show. It's really funny. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Derek loves it when me and Derek are together. We always get recognized by kids. Yeah. One time we, we were going to Atlanta for Workbench Con in, in a week, but last year when we were in Workbench Con, we were at some promenade having ice cream, just sitting on a park bench in the evening. And this kid walks by, everyone's coming out of the ice cream shop. And this kid comes out of the ice cream shop and kind of starts side-eyeing us. And uh, 
And then his brother comes, and then all of a sudden, there's three little boys eating ice cream, just all kind of staring at us. And I go, you know us? I go, you know who we are? And then what the oldest son, the oldest kid goes, yeah, you're the mean guy from that TV show. <laughs> <laughs> and then the father and mother come out, and then they're like, these guys are on TV. And the, the, it was really funny. That's it, awesome. was really, it was really cute. In your experience teaching, because um, I was caught like college after high school, right? Like graduate. Yeah, I taught. Yeah, I taught yeah. twenty year olds. Um, even then, in those years that you taught, have you seen a difference in whether it's their attitude or their skill sets that, that they're bringing in since the the age of the the farm kid, the tinkerer, the kid who goes in the garage with their dad? Since that's all kind of phasing out, or it's gone. Well, like over, it's, it's it's rare. Yeah, over have the you seen twenty that? years. Oh, I, I taught in the city, so it was a little bit different than, yeah. you know, I never really saw any rural kids, but there were kids that grew up in rural communities. And then there was definitely more of a passion for making when I first started teaching. People were much more impressed by the things that I did and were more impressed and more inspired to learn. As time went on, I would have, say, for instance, like out of 20 students, I'd have like five or seven that were really interested. And by the time I was done teaching, there was always like two and the rest would still be very inspired. And there was, but when I say two, like two kids that want to learn everything, the rest were like, I, the, I turned some kid onto book binding, and that's all that person did. Oh, I turned I see, this, yeah. I turned this kid onto lamp making. We'd always make a lamp every year. The kid went nuts making lamps. But you know, like that's enough. Like that's good. Mm -hmm. If the kids want to do one thing, that's great. But every year there was like one or two kids that wanted to do exactly what I did. They wanted to learn everything. And that was great. I'm still in touch with a lot of my students that were really interested in the class and interested in me. And it's great. Some of my students that I had 20 years ago, they're like, my kids are watching you on TV. It's like ridiculous. That's so cool. It's yeah. like a full circle almost. Yeah, hey? yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's wow. amazing. It's crazy. I, I, the other day I was at my, we're cleaning out my dad's house and his workshops and everything. And uh, some we did a, Facebook post. So anybody wants to come and take, we're giving away most of the stuff. And uh, a kid goes, how do I know you? And I go, I don't know. He's like, so I'm helping him. He's taking all the metal. He goes, I know you. He goes, are you on YouTube? I'm like, yeah. I go, I'm Jimmy the rest of from YouTube. He goes, oh my God. He goes, I've been watching you since I was a little kid. And now I'm talking to like an adult man. And uh, at one point he says to me, he goes, don't, don't be offended by this. He goes, but the reason I didn't recognize you is because you got so old. I said, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. Get, yeah the, get the hell out of my shop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that just goes, just like, as I've been doing this for 13 years, and if he was like 24, 25, he was, you know, a young teenager when he mm. started watching me. That's cool. And I had, you know, my beard was black. Now my beard's great. That's a, that's so cool that the amount of people you've or anyone, but for the purposes of this conversation, how many people you have inspired and impacted, and now it's getting into multiple generations. Of, but but at the end of it, not not to generalize it or to diminish it at all, but you're just doing what you love. And, yeah, and no, it's, it's true. It's it's all, I'm just, make, it's I'm really just cool. making stuff. Yeah. Yeah, Derek always compliments me like that. He always says, you know, he goes, you're just doing what you goes. If the cameras aren't here, you'd be doing the same thing. Yeah, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. People always say, like, what would I do if if I won lotto or if if, uh, if I could retire? I say, I, nothing would change. Yeah, just this. I don't think. The cameras would just be off. <laughs> yeah, I just wouldn't. Re I, I probably would still record it just for future generations. I would just leave it on my computer. Move from the city to your... It would mm -hmm. be country acreage. Did that, I mean, building your workshop and all that, did that inspire you in a kind of new environment? Or was it just kind of, were you in the same mindset with just a different area? Did no, honestly, when up? I moved up, when I moved up to the country, my mind exploded. I started buying machines. I rented the space. I never thought I'd fill it. Now I'm trying to get rid of stuff. It's so full. I, build my shop in the backyard it's got too much stuff in it i'm building the barn it's gonna have i have the farmhouse down the block which is the project that's gonna have too much stuff in it so it, it inspired me to collect things that i probably shouldn't i should I, i've definitely curtailed my collecting I, i'm not i'm not gonna let myself become a hoarder but when it comes to trying new disciplines like various types of welding which i wasn't able to do in the city plasma cutting which i couldn't do in the city and and uh, a lot of auto mechanics, I started collecting pickup trucks because I couldn't keep them around the city, but now I can keep them up here. 
and just my 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 mind got bigger because my space got bigger mm, and my, the playground of my mind got bigger I, i'm trying not to be i'm trying not to be frivolous and buy things that i'm never going to use or play with or that's why sometimes like when i have so much stuff now I'll, I'll i'll look around and be like you know that's been sitting here for two years let me just give it to somebody that wants it you know i bought that convertible cadillac years ago if you guys ever remember seeing it on instagram yeah and i started fixing the floors i welded this and, and i was just like this is such a big project i don't really have the heart for it right now so i gave it to my friend mike and he he, he tinkers on it but definitely opened up my ability to collect bigger stuff and you know there'd be a time when i'm like wow that's really cool i want this thousand pound jointer that's made in 1911 but i there's nowhere i could put it then when i got the house upstate i started buying stuff like that when i first got my bridge port i didn't know i didn't have the ability to use it my workshop upstate wasn't set up but i did own the house and i i hired a mover to move my the bridge port that i got for free from somebody I moved it up here and put it in the backyard and put it under a tarp. And it wasn't until a few years later that I was able to set it up. So um, uh, it, having the property was a big was a big improvement in my ability to make cool stuff. Is the bridge was scenery a part of that too, in a way? Oh, you yeah. Know, in the country, and be, I guess maybe being a little bit slower and not having the hustle and bustle of the city? Yeah, you know, honestly, yeah, the hustle and bustle of the city and being able to be a little bit more relaxed in the mind. This is all probably unconscious, but not worrying if someone's going to rob my truck. And, yeah. you know, like I, every night I leave my key. I shouldn't say this, but I leave my keys in my cars. I leave my wallets on the front seat of my Like I never like, where's my wallet? It's always in the front seat of my car. No matter where I go, I drive to the supermarket. I just take out the credit card I need. I leave my wallet on the front seat of my car, I leave my keys in the car. You know, I couldn't do that in the city. The stress of being like, oh, did I take everything off the car? Did I take the little handful of change that was in my cup holder so no one steals it, breaks my car window for $4 and change in my cup holder? Yeah. You know, like that's all out the window, you know. Mm -hmm. And in the city, and it's in the, this sounds stupid, but, you know, in the city, I couldn't carry this in my pocket. I'd use it in my workshop, but if it was in my pocket and I was on the subway, I can get arrested. Mm hmm so like constantly checking to make sure that my knife wasn't showing in my pocket, you know, all these it, it, it's stupid little freedoms that you lose being in a big city. But the, just the, the multitude of all these, and then like living in such a confined space. I lived in a building for so long. I knew all my neighbors. They're constantly asking me for a pair of pliers. Can I borrow your saw? Can you, can you help me strip it? The paint off of this dresser. Can you, you got a pickup truck and you help me go pick up something I bought on Craigslist. Like it, it, you live in a building with hundreds of other people that you get to see minute to minute. Mm -hmm. Now up here, I wake up, I don't have to talk to anybody for three hours, which is great. <laughs> That's awesome. And I can just focus on whatever it is I'm working on. Is the And I could stay up late uh, being up here. The, the other thing, I, working in the city, I had to stop working in my shop every night at seven, eight o'clock. Oh, really? Because people lived upstairs from me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The noise button, yeah. I'm grinding, welding, everything. It doesn't matter. There's no there's no sound restrictions on 40 acres. Fair enough. Yeah. What's the coolest uh, tool? Is it is the Bridgeport the coolest thing you have out there right now? Or are there a couple other gems well, that you've picked up? I love my big giant bandsaw. I, I'm buying a bandsaw from Keith Rucker, which is going to be insane. It's got four-foot diameter wheels on it. And <laughs> it's going to be huge. It's 12 feet tall. That's awesome. The coolest thing is probably the... We, we started building a horse barn a few years ago. Now the project kind of went on stall, but now it's coming back to life. Patrick, my buddy, the electrician, he's helping me with the electric and planning out the lighting. And as far as the coolest thing, I don't know. I guess my my the coolest thing I have at the moment is a dually. I got a 2023 Chevy dually. I love that. You love it? I just, yeah, I love to think, what can I pull? Can I pull a tree stump out of the ground with it or something? I don't know. Yeah, pull the barn down after you build it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you can, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the, what's your favorite process to like, as far as like welding or like, what's your favorite process? And then couple that with what's one that you'd like to learn that you haven't learned yet? I like, I really do enjoy metal work. I like the idea of welding metal and it being kind of done once it's metal. Because when you get into woodwork, you got to you gotta mill the wood. You got to clean it. You got to glue it. You got to finish it. You got to sand it. You got to sand down, sand through the veneer. That's a big problem. You, know, you got to make your drawers. You got to make your drawer slides. You got to make your face frames. You got to this. And then 
too much welding work. something <laughs> welding something together it's just like boom that's 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 it it's done let's grind it keep it out of the rain that's it yeah you know that's that's really fun welding is fun and then the discipline i started experimenting with and when i cast a bell a couple months back the idea of casting metal it's so intimidating it's so nerve-wracking it's so much to set up everything can go wrong in an instant but it's still invigorating so that's something i want to do more of is casting and i got everything i need to do some more casting in some upcoming videos that's awesome. gonna cast some some bronze oh cool yeah any idea of what what you're gonna cast like another bell yeah yeah or... well years ago um we made my my friend put out a, a competition to make my light just died to put out a competition to make a, a pen a no lathe pen challenge can oh, you make no, a pen without no a lathe? lathe cool yeah so uh, that was a really funny idea and i made this little guy with arms and legs i'm looking around to see if he's here and i made so i made him out of clay and he held a, a pen in his head so his body was a pen his head was the pen he had arms and legs and I want to do that, but I want to cast them in bronze. So I want to make a little clay model of a, and then he might hold a Sharpie or he might hold a, a pen, a big pen. That's so cool. we're going to make, and again, the idea, I'm always kind of leaning towards like making things that I could sell as art. So mm -hmm. I'd make, you know, 20 of those, see if I could sell them as limited edition or something. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you'd have no problem getting rid of those. That's for sure. Thank you. Are you at the point now where, um any are you at the point now where you think of an idea and you're like yeah that's still not going to work as far as like quality or or not integrity but like you don't seem like the guy the type of guy who would just think of an idea and make it and just stamp your name on it and it would sell you know what i mean you seem like the yeah. type of guy who would who yeah no it to has to have it has to have like a certain like for instance i was in walmart today walking around looking for ideas and I saw there's a whole wall of cookie cutters and like cookie food prep. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I've been wanting to make cookie cutters for so long, but I'm like, there's just not enough substance there. I could make a video of me making a cookie cutter, but I don't know. There has to be something interesting about it. Like maybe I can make a cookie cutter that like several parts come together to make like a three dimensional animal or something. I don't know. But the idea of just making a cookie cutter, I always, it always comes up, but I just can't. There's, it's missing that one element that like the makes cookie it, cutter that makes the. You know how I just had that idea of that that T Rex, the T Rex model that it, it'd be like bo the wood bones. You know yeah. what I mean? With making yeah. that out of cookies, you'd have like yeah, a cookie yeah, yeah, cutter yeah, like for each one of those. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you just have this cookie T Rex that would just fall apart in a couple of days. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. But you know, I don't I don't execute every idea I have, obviously, who's got the time. But you know, the ones that bubble to the surface are the are the ones that are lately like going as I mature, you know, I gotta kind of stay relevant. And lately, a good example of what I'm about to say is the is the neon video. I'm gonna try and do more problem solving, more tinkering, a little bit more like inventing on the fly in my videos. And now that I'm for Patreon, I'm doing everything. I'm doing everything everywhere. Patreon used to be just reserved for voiceover stuff. Mm. So I think every video I do from now on, I'll probably have some sort of voiceover or some throw to camera in it, talk to camera type yeah. of thing, just to make it more interesting for the fans and for me. A squirrel moment. I see the, the 3D printer in the background. How's that been going? Oh, good. Actually, they emailed me today. My buddy's been using it to make parts. My buddy that lives here. Okay. My buddy, Ryan. Now, it's, I just haven't had, I haven't printed anything lately. They actually emailed me to like, hey, have you made anything on it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you talked about some yeah. of your voiceover and stuff, and you, I feel like you were kind of on the forefront with some of your video creation where there wasn't a lot of voiceover. It was just you working. And yeah. I think for, for myself and probably lots of people, I learned from, I'm a very visual person. So to be able to watching you go me through too. your build, you know, sometimes people maybe over talk. So now you're wanting to change from that a little bit. Yeah. Well, um, I always make my, I always tell my story anyway. So I'll yeah. tell the story visually Yeah. and then I'll do some voiceover and just to change it up to make it a little bit more, you know, just to evolve a little bit, I'll throw in some conversation, but I'm not going to be gratuitous. I'm not going to talk just to hear myself talk like a lot of people do. I'm just going to give information, just insightful information. People really do like when they can hear my thought process. So if mm -hmm. it's relevant in that in that regard, what made me make choices or where I'm willing to take a risk just to see what happens. Yeah. And a lot of people will be like, I've come this far 
And then I'm like, you know, sometimes I've come so far and I'm like, I can't, I don't want to make any more changes. I'm too afraid. Yeah, not literally afraid, but you're mm -hmm. afraid you're going to like throw the material up. You're going to waste money, waste, you know, waste the days worth of work. But, you know, I, I, I want to try and dispel that fear in a lot of people that are watching and being like, you've come this far, make it again. Yeah. You know, you've, you've, made, you've made this, make it again. You know, the day wasn't wasted. Now that if it took you 12 hours to get this far and you screw up tomorrow, it's going to only take you five hours to get this far because all the thought processing, learning. And then if you did it a third time, that would take you probably four hours. Mm -hmm. You know, so just trying to instill a lot of that learning in the people that are watching. It's intentional. And that's really cool that because some people probably just put out videos just just to get content out. And it's really cool. I, I've that done that. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I got seven eight hundred videos yeah sometimes you got to put out something to put an ad in it like I'm, I'm obligated to put an ad for you know some insurance company so i'm like Shh, yeah what am i going to make this weekend oh let me just make this stupid thing yeah yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> time lapse and, 3d printer there we go yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i'm just saying the youtube is just a tough game now for me i think i've been around for so long they just like put me on the back shelf but i'm still making content because it, it adds up to reels and whatever yeah I was just wondering, how did you become, a, where did you learn to tell stories? How did you become a, st a storyteller? Because you're you're really good at it. And, oh, well, uh, thank you. It's thank really you. cool to to watch and just to see, even just how how you form the story, even just sharing the stories here. Who did you pick that up from? Was there someone like, I grew in up in a town or? where everybody was very funny comedian. I grew, Everybody I grew up with was very funny, including my brother who went on to become an actual comedian. But everybody I grew up with was funny and everybody told stories and, you know, everybody reiterated the funny times we had the next day, everyone's telling the story again. So that was a big part of learning that skill set. But uh, when it came to talking about the camera in 2000, 2001, when uh, Final Cut Pro became available on the Apple, one of my students got me a hack version of it. And I learned a lot of things from my students. And a couple of my students sat with me and taught me how to edit. And I started experimenting in 2000 with editing. And then as time went on, I started experimenting, making short little films. This is all before YouTube. Mm -hmm. And that's how I started selling TV shows with my brother, me making the shorts. In fact, one of the early videos on my YouTube channel is, is a thing called Lord of the Fleas, which was the early version of a show that became Dirty Money. Mm. And that's the stuff I did with my brother, just having fun with a camera out in the street and me tinkering on final cut pro which is also iMovie iMovie's the pared down version of final cut pro yeah that's really it's it, hearing you talk about that reminds me of what i've heard um like casey neistat and his background growing up with his sure. brother and just he yeah. just recorded stuff and did just because he thought it was fun and making yeah. films and that kind of thing that's really cool just having fun, yeah. Diff I never met I never met Casey in person. We talked online a little bit, but we never met in person over the years. We have a lot of friends in common, which is crazy because yeah. we're both New Yorkers. And That's cool. uh, I'm a huge fan of Casey. He's yeah. been a big inspiration to me. So telling your stories through your videos, um, were you purposeful in uh, in a lot of your videos that are maybe time-lapsed a little bit or fast-forwarded? Um, was that just how you were comfortable? Were you comfortable um speaking and being because I mean even for this podcast when we started I was even though we're teachers you put me in a room of you know 25 30 kids I'm fine adults that changes it a bit now even you know trying to converse with people that we've never met it was a big growing opportunity or I guess a big growth for me to get comfortable um, yeah for you was that kind of did you decide to do that was that purposeful or was that just well, what you wanted to share and tell your story it just it just became natural when people started focusing on me. I, I remember when my mentor at school, visual arts, where I graduated from, <clears throat> he said, can you come back and teach? Because I was always a little bit ahead of the curve because I tinkered a lot more than most of the kids I was in school with. So he said, I need you to come back and teach a materials class. I want you to teach how to use all these different materials, which is really what my, teach, my class was about. And I said, all right, I'll come back and do that. And so I started teaching a couple of years after I graduated. And I remember the first day I was in front of 25 students and they were all staring at me and I was like I have to keep these kids entertained with my voice for the next I I literally ran out of things to talk about 20 minutes in and I, did, I had a three-hour class I said all right you guys can go home I didn't know what to do <laughs> yeah and I said 
I started bringing in props, things to actually do with my hands, and that prolonged the conversation. Mm -hmm. So when I had props, and then when I became more comfortable being able to just freestyle in a group of, it's still, I still get intimidated. I mean, it's not that easy for me. <laughs> it's still not that easy for me. I certainly get stage fright. I mean, I'm a little nervous about this thing I got to do at the end of the week, but it's going to be kids. So mm -hmm. could be fun or it could be horrifying. I'm really <laughs> planning on being fun. Just the idea of uh, having props around me and being able to talk about things I authentically know about that that really really helps and being able to teach a room full of empty heads and i don't mean that in a bad way but you know teaching a, a room full yeah. of empty heads and sponges, you have all the yeah. interest yeah the sponges yeah, yeah. and it, it's it really can keep it going because all of a sudden they're like wait how does that work that's a knife what does that do that's a pair of scissors you know like oh this is how you do this and this is how you fold and this is what you the glue you use to bind a book and so the more comfortable I got with teaching what I know, the more I was able to fill in the time. And it got to the point where I talked right up to the, the class was done. That's cool. So uh, time goes on. And then occasionally I do lectures. I still get nervous. I just try to make sure that my PowerPoint has enough things in it to keep me busy for at least 30, 40 minutes, whatever it is. Yeah. Is it? It's probably interesting. Something Talking about something that you're well-versed in, like, I mean... Things that you take for granted, maybe like what, a, like what a knife does or a scissor does or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, with these kids, they're seeing it for the first time. You've talked about it for eight million times, probably, and these yeah. kids are seeing it for the first time, and it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> this is. What do you mean? What do you mean? What does that do? Oh yeah, you have no clue what this is. Like, yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. You're, you're kind of seeing it for the first time again through their eyes. I'm assuming too. Yeah, uh, it, it is funny when you when you. I always you kind of hold a mirror up to yourself when you you see somebody you know you meet interact with somebody that doesn't know what you do yeah and you say oh i do youtube what is youtube and i'm like oh well, how do you make money? it's always the question how yeah. do you make money on youtube and when you have to talk about yourself you start thinking like oh i, I get i have a pretty fun job yeah you know? yeah no kidding yeah well you know i got cool stuff when you get a chance to walk around and show people stuff I think yeah. it's the passion too, you know, when you're so like, I'm sure your stuff, maybe there's some days where, like you said, you have to put a video out or you've got these business arrangements, but when you're just in the shop, is it just peaceful for you? And like, does it feel just like a day of, you know, making things and not necessarily a job? Like, I feel like that's where you can really, that's where the success happens is when I think you get into that mindset of enjoying whatever you're doing, whether, yeah. you know, whether it's for a career or whatnot, but that passion comes through and it just kind of almost takes away the uncertainty, the nerves. And yeah, no, the, the passion to learn, the passion to figure stuff out. And, you know, uh, the a good way to jumpstart passion is to put yourself in, in a bind financially, <laughs> like uh, commit to buying a car you can't afford or something like that. Yeah. And then the passion comes in of like, okay, I got to make money. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know what? I got... 10 leather hides. What am I going to do with them? I got to turn them into money. Okay. Oh, let me make these cool bags. You know, that definitely jump starts your passion is years ago. One of my mentors, this woman, I was still close friends and she was a huge inspiration on me early on. She encouraged me to go to art school. She said, buy expensive things. It forces you to work. Mm. And people see me spending for, I, I I don't have kids. I don't have a marriage. I don't have anything. So it's easy for me to frivolously spend money. But at the same time, it does keep me busy. Buying f expensive things keeps you busy because you got to pay for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not saying be foolish with your money, but I also have a, a certain mindset where it's like, you know, we all don't live forever and tomorrow's not promised to us. And so if today you want that circular saw and it's like eh, a little bit outside your budget, who cares? Just get it. You'll fit. Yeah. You'll find the money. You somewhere can't else. take it with you. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to tell my wife that next yeah, yeah. time I go for a tool. Jimmy told me. Hey, that you know what? Eh. Remember that guy on Netflix? He told me yesterday. Yeah. I'm not going to pick on you guys for having kids, but yeah. people have kids all the time, have no idea how to pay for them. Yeah. You want to buy a circular saw? You'll figure out how to pay yeah. for the circular saw. You're going to figure out how to feed your kids. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you, you guys will probably both have more kids. Yeah. But maybe. as hard as it is right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I got three. That might be, that might be, uh, 
I think we're we're done it too. I I'd rather go buy some more tools. <laughs> yeah, another circular saw. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> make some more money. Uh, yeah. Right on, well, Jimmy. As we kind of wrap up here, um, yeah. What advice do you have for somebody wanting to get into? I don't know if you want to call it the you know creator, fabricator, maker, mm -hmm. builder. What what advice do you have somebody who'd be considering getting into this field? I, I you really got to do it because you're passionate. You really got to do it because it's something that there's something within you that's driving you. I always liken it to being, for instance, somebody that wants to be a, a sports star. You know, those kids that are sports stars, you could see the way they were born into it. And and if you're not born into it, you have to really let it take you over. You know, you really got to put yourself into it, heart and soul. If you want to dabble, it's just a hobby. But if you really want to make a career out of it, you got you to gotta really be passionate about it. Like these kids that practice gymnastics and become uh, Olympic team members. If that's what you want to do, you really got to, you got to put your heart and soul, but you have to have a passion for it. You can't just do it and be like, ah, oh, maybe I'll try this. You see, sometimes you, when you talk to 18 year olds as they graduate high school, you're like, what are you going to do? You're like, I don't know. Maybe we're going to go into economics. I don't know. Or political science. Or, or I don't know. Um, but then you talk to them five years later and they're doing pottery. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they finally found something that got them. Yeah. You know, like something that it, it doesn't, doesn't happen to everybody right away when that spark comes. That was the one interesting thing about teaching is like I said, you know, I, I could see the spark, like mm -hmm. students were kind of lackadaisical checking their phones and not being, but then I show book binding and it'd see like one student, the, her eyes would light up. She'd be like, oh, that's how a book's made. And then she's making books all the time on her own without my instruction and looking online, see how they were made and looking at other books. You know, that passion has to be ignited, whether it's not from within or it's got to be ignited by your experiences. Mm -hmm. you, 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 and it, it all gets down to being curious. If you're not curious, you're dead inside. Yeah. I love so that. So curious and passionate. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Okay. That's awesome. Now, what about some technical skill sets that would be good to develop getting into? Uh, yeah, I think it's important to learn computer programs such as Illustrator, Photoshop. Those are the two things I use most. I can translate photo, I can translate Illustrator into all different types of cut paths. So I'm able to use oh, Illustrator cool. and use it for CNCs and laser cutters. I didn't know that. A, a little bit. Yeah, well, as long as it's a vector, you can export a yeah. vector and bring a vector in somewhere else. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm i a little bit lax in the 3D modeling, but I think it's really important for everybody to learn a 3D modeling program. You know, you know the way, like, we all know Word and... Mm -hmm. and excel i mean excel's horrible i hate excel but <laughs> yeah. you know you guys are around around teaching so you must know word word oh, yeah. and email programs the way we all know these type of programs yeah. as a 3d modeler or a 3d designer we really should learn illustrator of any vector-based design program it could be light burn for laser cutters or it could be vectrix for cnc machines or illustrator all those three programs are fairly interchangeable learn one of those programs or all of them and it's really important because digital fabrication is really is really something you know, it's mm -hmm. really something that's not going to be overlooked 3d modeling is really important when i say 3d modeling like fusion 360 or autocad one of these type of programs if you can get good at that i think you'll never be hungry yeah you go do you like on your concepts or your drawings do you how much would it be percentage wise that you're doing in a program versus pen or pencil to paper, you know, the, the, the sketching. I sketch a lot on notebooks and I sketch in notebooks and like little moleskins and such. A lot of times I find myself sketching. These are all the cutoffs from my printing press. Hmm. <laughs> so these lay around my printing press and I grab them. I grab a little one inch stack of them and then I draw on these things. That's cool. And so I find myself making notes on bits and pieces of paper all the time. Like here's a little drawing I did last night mm -hmm. showing a friend how they could bevel file an edge of a piece of steel they oh, want to put yeah. a bevel you know and this is a file on a stick so i'm always doing little sketches like that um and then once i get a more focused idea then i go to illustrator if it's going to be a laser cut such and such or 3d maybe maybe i'm making a print block i go right to illustrator and start designing graphics for a print block or something hmm. okay interesting uh, last question. Um, top three starting out tools. Uh, I would get a table saw. And if you're going to be a machinist, a bridge port. So I, I consider like a bridge port, like a table saw. 
uh, every machinist needs a bridge port. So, but if we're talking about just simple wood shop stuff, definitely a table saw, maybe a job site saw for keep it affordable, a band saw, and uh, I think a, some type of sander. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, like an upright sander, especially if you're going to be a tinkerer, like you can get like a one by 36 belt sander or like a one by 24 belt sander at Harbor Freight. You guys have a, you have the, what do you call it? Princess Auto. Auto. Yeah, you guys have Princess Auto. You know, yeah. you can get some of those cheap tools there, oh, yeah. like a disc sander. Because I found when I was a kid, tinkering on my dad's 12 inch disc sander was always so important to be able to like quickly change the shape of something or mm. grind the head off a screw or, you know, short in the spring yeah. you know there's, there's always there's always like a quick something to go to the sander yeah that's a good point or yeah. you didn't or you didn't cut close enough to the line in one spot and zip it off yeah or whatever yeah yeah, yeah. Well, jimmy i want to say thank you so much for uh taking time today to come on the thanks, show thanks guys and, this was good it was and, fun uh we really appreciate your time and uh as we kind of wrap up here uh where can people find you and is there anything you want to promote um, now's the time. Uh, yeah, no, just check me out. My, my, uh, well, I was going to say my YouTube channel, my website, Instagram. I just started doing Patreon more. I, I've been on Patreon for eight or nine years, but I really just kind of kicked it up a notch. Just to uh, want to give people a lot of value. And for me, Patreon is fun because it's kind of reminds me of the early days of YouTube where anything you put up kind of got attention. Mm. Now you got to think about the thumbnail, the title, you know, these guys that are really cracking the code, doing all these types of stuff. Uh, they seem to be uh, focused more on you know trying to hack the algorithm than be creative. So I, I'm I'm torn. I want to do both, but ha- me having fun on Patreon is kind of scratching that itch for me. That's cool. Yeah. Well, we'll link to all those in the show notes of this episode. But once thank again, you. thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, we're both super fans, and this means so much Thanks, that, you, that you came on the show. So thank you again. Of course, guys. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone for listening. Thanks, Hoff. Thanks, Rosie. And we'll catch everyone in the next one. Bye, guys.